You can pause the, uh, you can pause it anyway. Okay, why, why am I, I'm Test it. I've got it on. It's muted, but we just and we just have that. So live stream is showing just the what you're seeing here, the yeah. Windows startup. Correct. That, that's what's. Or uh, well, it's actually just the Windows screen at the moment, which I'm not sure why we don't have yours. Okay. Do you stop sharing? Yeah, I didn't see it. Oh. So yeah, can you just right. do that and check your link? They want to make sure that everything's running. Can I move that right there? Um, you can. I just don't know why you're not. So the live stream is up as you see you right there. It's muted for now. And with today's meeting, it's slightly different. Because well, we have no the right piece of work on this for us to just get technology hooked up to do it. Oh, there it is. Well, right now, this will. Do you want me to open it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah what, when we open that, we'll just. Uh, and is there someone else, like, in your commission meeting? What we're doing. No, no, like, no we're, we're like everyone that. Here. They're just uh, talking. Yeah. But yeah. right now, yeah. everyone's yeah. going yeah. around the world. Good. Watch our yeah. 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 That's the idea of it. Uh, yeah. yeah. I want to see what you're seeing at the moment. Fifty first whether or not you're seeing his uh, his PowerPoint presentation. Why is that just his job? Your tax dollars. Well, not your tax dollars. It works. My tax dollars. But actually, you bought a coffee. Yeah. You're not muted. Yeah. You're not muted. Well, you're you're seeing it as you right now. You see the PowerPoint presentation. Um, okay. Well, now. Do they have talent as well? Uh, we're muted right now. No, you're not. You're not. Oh, you didn't mute. Just a bit as we were saying. We have the. We're bilateral.
Good morning and welcome to the February 5th, 2016 meeting of the DNA subcommittee. I'm Dr. Adams. Also joining us today are Dr. Stever, Tozer, Jewell, Eastman, and Pitt. That constitutes the forum. And so let's begin. You've received a draft agenda in your binder. Do I have a motion regarding that agenda to approve it? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. You've also received a draft copy of the minutes of the November 13th, 2015 meeting. Any questions or comments related to the minutes? Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Also have that passes. In your binders, we have a number of documents related to accreditation and laboratory updates. The first relates to the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of Forensic Biology. And included in there is the external 2AS audit and some revisions to Appendix D. This particular item requires a vote. And we have members of that laboratory either here or available to respond if necessary. Are there any questions related to this particular accreditation effort? I have a question. I mean, I have to ask. How did they forget to put all this information on the training in the audit document? Good morning. Meredith Rosenberg, Quality Assurance Manager for the Department of Forensic Biology. I don't know how they missed those eight, seven or eight names. I, in speaking to one of the assessors, she mentioned that there was a list of names that was handed to her for, I think it was for entry into the document, but I think she misunderstood and removed those names from the document. And so it wasn't caught until they were off site and I reviewed the full final document and realized that those names weren't on there. So we know for sure that they did review their training. The lead assessor contacted the assessment team and he confirmed that they were reviewed. Thank you. I have a question. I enjoy looking at validation and what new technologies you're bringing on and improvements in the laboratory. I was just wondering if perhaps we could talk about either any DSA tests you brought on, any anomalies, what did you have before, where do you have now, and what can give you a feeling about what your reporting language is when you do CT tests. I'll refer to our technical leader. Sure. Good morning, Eugene Wien, the DNA and serology technical leader of the Department of Forensic Biology. We validate the certified card because it's much faster and it is a presumptive test and our wording is the standard wording that New York State has guidelines on and it remains a presumptive test that we indicate that CN is critical. So before the certified cards, we used an assay called P30 ELISA. That took about four to five hours to do, so we wanted to make that a little bit shorter and within ten minutes we could have results. I think it's a much faster and much more efficient way of operating. And you can do a side-by-side, I presume, and how did those results look? They're consistent with each other, yeah. And the amylase card? The amylase card, we used to do an amylase diffusion test, which also took a lot longer. Again, this is a test that saves a lot of time. It's a little bit more expensive, but it saves a lot of time. And again, the results are consistent with each other during validation. Thank you. Can I ask you a quick question? The diffusion test, was that a starch plate test? Yes. What about the relative sensitivity? Can you find a starch plate test in your test? 
I can't remember, but it was comparable. Otherwise, it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have gone this way for a lot. It, actually, I think the, uh, the cards itself are a little more specific and are more sensitive, if I remember correctly. But I need to uh, find that out to confirm. Did you, did you test them against rat saliva? I don't think we did, no. We tested. Because they tend to cross react. We, it is a test uh, for amylase. So it remains as a presumptive test for saliva. So uh, we, we, while we can say that amylase is present, we, we don't say that saliva is confirmed. It's presumptive. Is this the, oh, it's the Ceratex test? Yes. I'm unfamiliar with the other one. The other <laughs> One other question: Would you uh, do you use it as a uh, decision point uh, in your in your protocol? Positive, you go one way; negative, you go the other way. Well, at, at some point, we do use it as a decision point. Uh, however, um, for the most part, these are used on sexual assault kits, which the uh, main bodily fluid of interest would be semen uh, or, or saliva. So, if there's any indication that um, we need to test that. Yes, it is a decision point that we do use to send off. Otherwise, it wouldn't be tested. Sure. Other questions? Do I have a motion to issue a binding recommendation to the New York State Commission on Forensic Science to approve uh, the renewal of the New York State accreditation to the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner? Department of Forensic Biology in the Discipline of Biology for the period covering March 16, 2016 to November 18, 2019. I'm looking for a motion. or laboratory uh, updates uh, with information for you. Uh, members of each of those laboratories are either available here or by phone. Uh, none of these require a vote, but we will take them one at a time in case you have any questions or concern. The first would be my County Crime Laboratory. Are there any questions or issues that you would like to address? Next would be Nassau County Medical Examiner Division of Forensic Services. I have just one slight thing. Go ahead. Uh, I'll grab I think I'll ask you just to speak up when you can, because the audio is a little low on the webcast. Good morning. Good morning. This before, and I feel uh, negligent if I don't ask it again. Uh, not your lab, but uh, previous lab. On, on Appendix C, there's typically the self auditors sign off on that they, they meet all the requirements and such. And that wasn't on the document we received. Actually, it is filled out. I just noticed that yesterday. The signatures oh. aren't there, but the people's signatures are on the front of the document. Oh, okay. But it is filled out what their qualifications are. Okay. We yeah. just forgot to populate the signatures, but all the information is there. Because okay. I made sure of that because last year it was a point of discussion. Yeah. Okay. So it is all in there. Yeah. That was it. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Uh, next would be the New York State Police Crime Laboratory. Questions or comments? County Center for Forensic Sciences. Any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, just catching up with my presentation skills here. Uh, the week for the New York State Lab, which is deadline for tonight. We can certainly go back. Okay. Yeah. New York State Police. I'm Ray Wickenheiser. I'm the director of New York State Police. 
crime lab system. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, once again, uh, just preface this, I'm interested in validations of interest. The, uh, I noticed when you approved validation in this uh, uh, assessing capillary, capillary array limits and stuff, I'm just curious how, how you went about you did that and uh, what sort of criteria you used to uh, make that assessment. Uh, <clears throat> no. Um, Thomas Leach, our, our head of data bank, was, was part of that, but he's saying it was not part of That's, it. That was a casework validation. Oh, casework validation. I was assuming it was a data bank, but um, part of what we're doing is evaluating um, various technologies going forward. Um, so I can't speak specifically as to that. Our technical leader is not present. Um, I do know we, we are upgraded validation looking towards uh, moving not only to the 3500s, but looking at um, moving forward with various kits to go to the, the um, We'll say global filer, but also the competitors as well. So um, I can't speak to the specifics of it. I apologize for that. Yeah. I'm just curious. Often folks look at uh, resolution over time and that sort of thing. I'm just curious what you did. So, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. I just I can't provide I any detail. You know, we'll touch base and some other things. Okay. <coughs> I apologize. Thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll move back to the Onondaga County Center for Forensic Sciences. Any questions? None. Uh, finally, the Westchester County Department of Laboratories and Research Division on Forensic Sciences. Uh, questions or comments regarding their update? None. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, we'll move on to old business. Um, and we'll begin with partial match update. And Brian, you could uh, provide us with some stuff. Sure. Uh, essentially, this is one of the things we usually do in the meeting is just go over uh, the partial match program and talk about components of it. So um, at this point, there's 87 names that have been requested. The evaluation cannot confirm in 35 of those cases. Uh, total names released for 48. Pending statistical evaluation are four that are still in the pipeline. 45 cases are closed. Three are active. Um, in three cases, a relative was identified. Two results in an arrest and one resulted in conviction. One of those is still pending in the judicial system. regarding that update. I know at our last meeting uh, we had a discussion uh, on this about the revision, possible revision of the partial match policy and I believe that um, our group had asked the state police along with others to bring forward to this um, committee uh, a recommendation. Um, Ray, do you have an update for us on that issue? Yeah, I, I can just uh, provide an update as to uh, where we are. Um, we've been working with the various labs in the state to draft a comprehensive memo, uh, but since one of the components or key components of that memo would be to allow all of the labs to use CODA 7, because at present we uh, only have the software at the state police and we want to have something that every lab can use it. Um, <clears throat> so we feel it would be a little premature to uh, draft that memo until we've actually looked at the validation and approved that. Uh, we have a presentation before you uh, which we'd like to give and ask for your approval for the use of CODA 7. I uh, intend to have the memo ready for the uh, next meeting in May. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll save that for new business <coughs> today and for the future meeting as well. Okay. Thank you. The next old business item would be the mixture interpretation and uh, we've already looked at the November BioTwig letter regarding uh, that issue and the desire of the New York labs to move towards uh, probabilistic uh, genotyping. Um, there is also in your binder a new PowerPoint presentation by Coble and, and Butler. And uh, uh, Brian, I, I think maybe you should at this time shed some light on that. Right. At the last Commission on Forensic Science meeting, uh, um, Commission member had brought this presentation up again, and it's a different one than you've seen before, so we figured we'd share it with you. But since there seems to be these recurring concerns about um, 
information from Dr. Butler's and Kobel, what I've tried to do is I tried to arrange for them to be at this meeting. The schedules weren't um, conducive to that, but I have arranged for the next DNA subcommittee meeting for both Dr. Mike Kobel and Dr. Uh, Butler, John Butler, to come here. And actually, I figured instead of looking at presentations one at a time, you could actually, you know, get it right from the horse's mouth as far as there's any questions, concerns, and have a more broad discussion on this issue. So I, I guess maybe this is just a placeholder uh, for now. And then, as I said, when they're here, you know, you can have a much more in-depth discussion about it. And again, I apologize. This uh, last commission meeting was in December, and when right after the meeting, I reached out to both individuals, and their just schedules couldn't allow it for a February meeting. But they, they were able to arrange for the main one. We look forward to that. And then the people that have issues with their or have specific questions about their talks will be able to be there too. So we can just kind of. I think that the general consensus or concern uh, just keeps coming up about this idea that CPI is better than probabilistic genotyping. And I think. The questions, we'll try and frame those questions for you a little bit better, but I think to a degree it's kind of asked and answered, I guess, a legal framework that this has been put before the subcommittee before. You have looked at this, you have discussed it, you did generate a letter specifically to that effect to the commission, but obviously this is an important point and it's something that's worth, you know, looking into. So as I said, when they're here, I think we can have that broader discussion. Move on to uh, new business. Uh, in your binder are the annual lab summaries that come into us at the beginning of each year. Uh, and uh, these lab summaries are for your review. Uh, are there any questions related to any of these uh, lab summaries? Blue tab there? Or? No blue tab. No, 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 I think I'm good. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. No vote is required there, it's just informational purposes. Uh, moving on to our next item of new business, um, it involves uh, CODIS 7, um, New York State Police validation of CODIS 7 for cal uh, calculating partial match statistics. Um, <coughs> we've been provided the document summarizes this validation, as well as the CD with the raw data. Uh, I believe we have Tom Leach here today to provide us with an executive summary, so uh, Tom, we'll uh, turn it over to you when you're ready. Good morning. Uh, for those that don't know me, um, my name is Thomas Leach, and um, I'm here from the New York State Police, uh, New York State DNA Data Bank. And I first want to thank uh, the DNA subcommittee members for allowing me this time to present. And I'm here today to present a partial match software statistical study. This is a study we've wanted to do for a while. Um, we had uh, we actually had Dr. Bieber and Dr. Kidd at our lab um, a few years back, uh, a couple years back now, in which we discussed the possibility of moving to CODA 7, and uh, we discussed some of the nuances of moving to that, which I'll explain as far as the differences between, between the softwares. I apologize that this is so far away. I don't know if anyone can see this. Okay. So the objective of this study was to, com uh, to compare our current partial, partial match software, which is partial match software that was provided by Dr. G um, from the University of North Texas. And what we wanted to do is compare how well the CODA 7 partial match module calculated EKR and EMR and compare that to 
uh, the partial match software, Dr. G's partial match software, and see what those results look like. The ultimate goal is we would like to replace with the partial match module um, in CODA 7. Right. So the reason for the change, as you recall from last year, there was uh, the FBI uh, amended the SDR population data from 1999 to 2000 uh, as a result of some uh, discrepancies, some errors in some of the allele frequencies. The software, the partial match, Dr. G's partial match software actually utilized those same frequencies for their software. Now that software is not software that we developed, it's not software that we ever edit or revise and we felt, we didn't feel comfortable going in and making those changes but we also really wanted to move to something that was more supportive. The, the other reason, as I just, just alluded to, is that the Dr. G's partial match software is just, it's not a supported software. And if we want to make changes going forward and we want something sound going forward, we really wanted to move to something that was fully supported. And the last point I just wanted to make is Dr. G's software was, it was only, it's only available to the state CODIS laboratory. None of the other local CODIS laboratories have um, were, uh, were able to access that partial match software. So what was happening is all the local labs were sending all the partial matches to the state CODIS administrator to do the calculations and then and sent back down to the local labs. And all that was being filtered through the Divisional Criminal Justice Services. Next slide. Um, for CODIS 7, for this uh, statistical study, the partial match module used the 2015 expanded FBI SDR population data, which is the most current population data offered by the FBI for the CODIS application. Um, and it includes, it also includes the expanded loci um, that were, or the expanded kits that we will see in 2017. It is fully supported software and it's maintained by the FBI, so we know we will have full support going forward for any changes that may come up. And then Again, this software is available to all the local CODIS laboratories so that eventually uh, the local labs will be able to do those calculations for the partial, that, and apply that um, in accordance with the partial match policy. <coughs> now the two main differences between the two softwares, just to be, to note, is that the, the first one I just mentioned, it's a different population database, the most current and accurate and correct, which is very important. And the other is that the CODIS 7 application does not allow a single mismatch locus as part of the calculation. Whereas the partial match, uh, Dr. G's partial match uh, program did allow the allelic information for the mismatch locus to be included in the calculation. So what we want to do is um, have a good representative of partial matches take a look at and, and do this assessment. And what we did was we looked at 69 partial matches that were previously uh, calculated with Dr. G's partial match software. And we knew the history of these partial matches. Um, so what we want to do is redo those calculations, um, and calculate EKR and EMR in CODA 7 for both full siblings and for parent offspring. And we did that, like I said, for 69 partial matches. So just real quick, and um, I'm going to move towards the monitors. We can read that. Um, EMR, for those that don't know, estimated match ratio. And what that's doing is comparing the target profile with all the possible gene types at each locus. Um, but it does not consider the, uh, the candidate profile that it matched to. Um, and what it's doing is it's setting, it's assessing what is more likely to occur, a partial match between a perpetrator and one of their relatives or a perpetrator or between, or between a perpetrator and an unrelated person. So it's not taking, it's not directly taking into account the, the actual profile that it matched. And then EKR, which is the next slide, estimated kinship ratio is an actual kinship calculation. And it is taking into account the genotypes of the two profiles that, that matched as part of that partial match. And it asks if the specific profiles are more likely to be seen in one pair of related people or unrelated people found in a given database size event. Can I ask yeah. a question? Is this yeah. just parent-child or is this sibling as well? I, 
When you say kinship, what do you mean by kinship? So I'm not sure I can answer that question, but the parent offspring, what it's done is the parent offspring, so I don't, and then the full siblings. And the only reason why I ask is when it says it doesn't allow a single mismatch, for full siblings, a quarter of the time, you're going to have no matches. I was just, I'm trying to understand that. Yeah, and I apologize, I can't, I don't want to misspeak on the kinship calculation. If I could just add, it's only for that one locus that it's not using that formula. All the rest will be used. So when you say a quarter of the time, but it would only be for the single locus where there is a mismatch. So it doesn't include, if there's a mismatch, it just, it still reports an overall match, but it doesn't include that locus? Correct. Just that one locus is being avoided. That's the difference between the two programs, besides the actual tables that the FBI are using. So, yeah, so as part of a normal search, we allow for a mismatch. Only one single locus mismatch. So we would generate moderate, what we call moderate matches, which may have a mismatch as well as part of that. And that's all our searches allow. We don't allow any additional mismatches. But if you had two siblings, and you were looking at, I don't think you're correct, 12 locations, you would expect three of them wouldn't match. That's correct. Well, 12 is your new gene frequency, but yes. Yes, yes, yes. To allow only one is an extraordinarily conservative search. Yes. Because much of the time, you're right, you would expect to find for full siblings quite a few loci on occasion. And likewise, two matches, you'd expect that as well. You know, you'd expect a quarter of the time to have both locations to match. So, yeah, this is... Both alleles to match at a location. And you're correct. The frequency that we identify with a partial match is quite low. Because, again, a partial match is just an, it's an inadvertent match that the analyst may come across, the codes administrators may come across and see a possible potential relative based on the genotype that's presented there. Do you have any additional questions? No, I'm just trying to understand. Sorry. No, that's okay. Keep going. Okay. I guess the point of that, we would never have, if there was three mismatches, we wouldn't see that in a search. Because the search is filtered for allowing for one mismatch. So, I'm with Ken there, that you're probably missing things. If I had two siblings... I would say the probability they're missing a lot approaches one. I mean, this is certainly a very stringent, it's highly conservative way of assessing partial matches. And we don't see a larger number of these. And maybe I'm off base because we should just be comparing both programs, not comparing, you know... Yeah. I mean, the intent of this is to try and just show the two programs, the results, and then from those results, you know, is CODA 7 a viable... Substitution. Substitute for calculating EKR in one. Just because I mentioned gene frequency, this is dependent upon that. What if there are different European, African American, Hispanic, God forbid, it's a non-genetic term, but it's unfortunately... Those are built in so you do the comparison against those databases using the gene frequencies in the databases. In the database that we're using, or the population databases that we're using? Yeah. Based on the literature that I've seen for the population database, I think that there is an assumption there of all the database, or I'm sorry, all the ethnic groups that are included in that, but... If I could just jump in. So Dr. G and Chakraborty Software is hardwired to the old databases that 
the FBI has now corrected. CODIS 7 will continuously use the most up-to-date, the corrected databases. So you'll get separate answers for each database. Correct. So you'll get... That's correct. And it will be always up-to-date yeah. and correct. And they did make, as part of that SDR population database um, for the FBI, they did make changes, and I believe they did consolidate some of the subgroups, like the Jamaican, African American, they did make some changes there. So there's certainly some differences between those databases. Sorry. So with EKR and EMR for those calculations, um, in order to pursue a partial match, there need, the, there's a partial match statistical threshold that needs to be met. And that threshold is that at least one of the database values in a subgroup is greater than or equal to one, and all the other subgroups are greater than or equal to 0 0.1. Um, this definition and the EKR and EMR calculations that I talked about do reflect what is in the sweet dam guidelines. Um, this is just an example of the calculation. I'm, I'm sure you can't see this at all. But basically, this was just exhibiting the comparison between two, the two softwares. We actually used an Excel uh, table in order to formulate um, and easily take a look at the data to determine <coughs> what sub subgroups were greater than one and to look at make sure that all the other subgroups were greater than 0 0.1. Um, so with that, once we got the calculation completed and we compared, um, we looked at the 69, the results of the 69 partial matches, and 20, what we found is 29 of those, uh, Dr. G's program and CODIS 7 met the statistical threshold. Then 12, Dr. G's program and uh, the CODIS 7 application did not meet. So we had 41 of the 69 that were consistent with uh, the EKR and EMR results. But we did identify that there was 26 partial matches in which it, the EKR or the uh, statistical threshold was met with Dr. G's program, but was not with CODA, with CODA 7. And then we did identify that there was two that met with CODA 7 and um, that didn't meet with Dr. G's. But what was the most concerning for us, obviously, was the 26, because uh, we wanted to move to CODA 7, and it would have meant that we would not have seen these 26 partial matches if we were originally using CODA 7. Um, I just wanted to point out, of the 69, there was actually three partial matches that actually led, that were probative and led to an investigative lead in the case of potential relative. And all three of those met in both CODA 7 and in Dr. G software. So there was no issue there, and we would not have missed a probative lead and from the partial matches that we looked at. So of the 26 partial matches that we looked, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, we, wanted to, we wanted to take a look at the outcomes of those cases to see what happened with those cases and did they actually lead to a uh, lead to some uh, program. So of that, and I'll read these, I'm sure you can't see this. Um, there was, of the 26, 12, Family trees were established in which potential relatives were excluded. So um, that was excluded and closed. There was nine in which were ruled out by additional YSTR analysis, and they were closed. There was two in which match identified with another offender in the case and was no longer pursued, and that they were closed. There was one in which a suspect was identified through um, other traditional investigative techniques, so it wasn't pursued and it was closed. And then um, there was one in which an offender was deported, partial match was not pursued, um, but they weren't able to get uh, or establish a family tree for that individual. Um, it was closed. And then finally, there is one case that of the 69 that remained pending, and a family tree was established, um, and there was uh, four potential relatives. Three, they were able to get samples for, and they were excluded. There's still one that um, evidently still is waiting on analysis. So I can't say for certainty that that one would have been closed without any additional investigative lead. So, but um, there was, a, like I said, 25 of the 26, there was no investigative lead or additional information that would have um, led to a potential relative or pursuit for a potential relative. So 
I just, yeah. just have two questions. Yeah. One, the one where the perpetrator was identified through traditional investigative techniques, was that the person that was identified through the comparison, or was it a different individual? Unfortunately, I can't, I can't speak to that, because I actually got this data from DCA. It's, um, it was anonymized, so I, didn't, I don't know the details of the case. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone, Brian, if you know any of the details of those. Yeah, in these particular cases, uh, the law enforcement agency will provide an update to us, and that is their update that they had another means. We didn't pursue to find out what that other means is or know what it is. So we don't know. There's I don't. We don't know if it's the same person or not. I don't. And then you do this, you do a match, you get a list, at, like, List. You mean a search? You do a search. So we do a, a normal search, yep. Okay. For again, forensics <laughs> and you get a against list. people. And then what do you do after that? What's so, the next step? So what will take place is we have a state search weekly. Uh -huh. And when uh, it will generate a set of matches. And what will take place is the state codes administrators will go, through, and will go through those matches. And what they're looking for initially is matches that are of high stringency because they know those are matches that are going to be acted on right away. Um, <coughs> those matches will go directly over to DCGS, and they will do a verification of the individual, uh, check qualifying offense, offender identity information. They will also kick off a process in the DNA data bank to confirm that sample, because we're going to know that the local lab's going to want that offender sample confirmed eventually. The moderate, the moderate, um, the moderate samples that they feel were, look to be probative, they will also be assigned um, based on that review. But there are a number of matches in there that they call what they call local pending matches because they're moderate. The CODIS administrator at the state cannot determine how probative that match is. So what will happen is that list will go, that those matches will be sent to the local labs along with all the other matches that, uh, that are there. But it will be up to that local lab to take a look at those matches and determine whether it's a no match or whether it's a conviction <coughs> match, a, an offender hit, or so forth. And then what they'll do is if they determine that it's, they want to pursue that, um, then they will contact the Division of Criminal Justice Services for verification and we'll do the confirmation. So I, I was really looking at something like this. You have a match. You have some investigation leader there, and then what do you do on something like this? You said you draw a family tree. So <clears throat> the local labs, <coughs> from the state labs, so we're so not, you we're not generating the pedigree, so they're getting generated. But what the local lab, they have the ability to create a pedigree tree, and that is actually done in CODIS. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak to how that's done. Um, but they will generate a pedigree tree um, and bring in, you know, get the, the control samples from those individuals that are potential, that are the potential relatives, and then, and then do those analyze comparisons. that. So. Okay. But actually, just to interrupt, before that even comes down, uh, there's a big component of this that happens with the law enforcement agency. And prior to moving ahead with this, the law enforcement agency and the DA's office have to commit to pursue it. So when there's an initial search and there's a potential partial match that comes out, we reach out to them to check, are you willing to pursue this? If they say no, it stops at that point because there's a significant amount of time and effort and work that needs to go to this. So it stops at that point. If they say yes, at that point, they look at the statistical threshold, see if it meets the statistical threshold, and then uh, you know we go ahead and release the name if in fact it is. That said, um, they will do a lot of investigation. So sometimes that family tree will say, you know, it could be a brother. So they look at the family tree and realize that the only brother is either institutionalized somewhere or is nowhere near where that place could have happened. Most of the investigation will occur by the law enforcement agency not involving science at all. Just basically saying, this person physically could not have been there at that time, and that's how they'll close it out. So they'll move it forward. So it's not as quick to jump to, we get an exemplar from that person. The majority of these are closed out because investigation shows they couldn't have been anywhere. This, this person's dead. This person's in here. This person is 85. And they said a 20 year old person did this crime. That they look at the other facts to see if things dovetail before it moves to the next step of trying to get an exemplar and move it forward. Okay. 
I was just asking, like, when you get that. I, I wasn't even going that far. Okay. Yeah, you no. have two samples. Is that looked at again to say, yeah, we have matches, but what does that match mean? That's all I was Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, like the, so it'll go to the local lab. And our and our search parameter, the search is not set up. You know, the partial match is an inadvertent find as part of their normal review okay. of okay. a number of moderate matches that are there. So our search parameters aren't set up for our partial match. Okay. It's just something that inadvertently that comes out of that review. Dr. Reeder, did you have a question? <coughs> well, I have a question and a comment. I think that the statistical uh, analysts that you're creating, that again, you, as you mentioned, came out of a SWIGDAM meeting, are very conservative and are unlikely to yield uh, usable results compared to traditional kinship calculations that are used in the so-called familial searching strategies that have more widely successful here and abroad. Uh, the question would be, have you taken a look at any of these cases to see something as simple as the amount of allele sharing between, which is a fairly crude way of looking at this, but has been actually quite successful in the UK and a few other countries in Europe. Uh, have you looked at those data? I, I know. the, the I know. databases are filled with right. SIVs and identical twin pairs and kin. That's not a theory, it's a, it's a reality. Yeah. I know early on, going back a number of years, they, they did start to take a look at that. I think it was discontinued. Um, but, you know, if that's something you would like us to take a look at, we can um, certainly... I could just speak to it briefly. I mean, the back. point here, we really, this has been instituted as a quality check no, no, I get matured. It. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, we really just haven't pursued that aspect of it, and we could be much more aggressive. This is just a byproduct of the, you know, finding it and not looking the other direction. Yeah, I don't know what the policy is, but if you have a summer statistics student who's passed the background check, this would be a good project for her. Yeah, I'd certainly agree. There's a lot of data there that we're not specifically yeah. looking for. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to derail what this substitution at all, yeah. but I just have I'm troubled when you have a kinship, when you're looking at a kinship statistic, and I don't understand it, but you're not looking at siblings. You're if you're having mismatches. You're definitely not going to find, most likely, not gonna, you might find identical twins, I guess, but. Um, but you won't find sibs. Yeah. So That's I don't correct. want yeah. you to. Mm -hmm. I just don't want this to go kind of down the road where you think you're doing something because of the terminology right. that you're yeah. using. Right. But I don't want to derail the subs. You know yeah. what's going on with the substitution. But I think we should just be mindful yeah. that people will be thinking you might. If I were looking at this, I'm thinking something very differently than what you're doing. And I'm thinking you're, more along you're the totally lines of what you're doing. Totally correct. I mean, it's certainly about. a very conservative way of trying to identify what you know, what the partial match. <laughs> Maybe just a little history there, too. And I think, uh, I, to my knowledge, I think only Eric and maybe Ken were on when Partial Match first came through. I don't recall. But from the inception of the Partial Match program, it was a highly conservative program. And I think the subcommittee in its previous iterations had said they weren't sure that it was even going to find anything, which is similar to the view that's being expressed today. Yet despite that, three people won the Powerball or whatever that thing was because we have three winners from this program is highly, highly conservative, no doubt. There's a lot that's probably being missed. But when you're walking down the beach, fish are still coming up from those searches. And those fish, when you look at them, are turning out to be potential serial killers. This is stuff that's validated through what the partial match program has already done. That's a surprise, I think, to everyone. Even I know I talked to Dr. Valentine about it. They were surprised at how successful it was, given how conservative it is. So I totally understand that what you're saying is not uh, it's, I'm not taking it lightly, but I'm just saying you're, you're reiterating what the previous DNA subcommittee said when they approved the first partial match program. Highly conservative, probably not going to find anything, yet still it's crazily seeming to work. So if you did it in a more scientifically sound way, I'm not saying, I'm just saying less conservative and right. more, um, you're very conservative, right. but probably scientifically not, I don't know if sound is the right word to use. But if you did it in a more scientifically um, realistic way, it could be even more powerful. No doubt about it. Okay. 
And so again, those are discussions that have been and had and other states have had about similar things. Probably less time consuming. Um, how do you figure on that? I think, I think because you, I, I think you could if you did the analysis a little bit differently, you probably could get, you could, you could bump the real hits up to the top instead of trying to pull them out of the noise at the bottom. Well, yeah. is what I'm saying. The, the previous or a previous slide, and it's uh, reiterated here. Dr. G's um, program allowed one mismatch. So it would allow a higher percentage of siblings to come through. Whereas CODA 7, you said, doesn't allow any mismatches. That's correct. Which means you're almost automatically excluding all siblings. Well, just let me just step back. We will still identify, um, we will still process a sample that if uh, an administrator identifies a match that they think is a partial match and it has a mismatch. We're still doing the calculation, except the mismatch locus information is not part of that calculation. So we're not ignoring that. Okay. So oh. we're still looking at it. But we're only giving the information that is not from the mismatch. We were not giving it the mismatch locus information. So, so you could and Dr. Kidd is correct. <coughs> we the Dr. G software was a little bit less conservative than the CODIS application because it did allow for the mismatch allelic information to be part of the calculation. And that's stems with some of the differences that we're seeing. So if there was no match, how is that? I don't want to, I mean, I, I'm still a little bit confused on that. If you have no match, I don't know how that could increase your statistics. If you have a profile that... So it's just giving you the likelihood of the profile, not the likelihood of the match. Yeah, right. So okay. you have two, two genetic profiles in which you have results for 13 of the loci. One of those loci is mismatched. The other 12 are a moderate match. They have, they're sharing alleles. Okay. But those they share are, at least one allele. Right. Those, the information for those 12 loci is, what, is what's used for the EKR and EMR calculations in CODA 7. We're not including that allelic information for that mismatch locus. Of course, CODA 7 won't allow it. Using a smaller number of loci in the calculation clearly alters the probability and makes it much more likely. So it's a strange. Right. <coughs> this is something that we have discussed when you. I don't know if you remember when we yeah. had those discussions at the lab, and you know, basically what takes place is in CODA 7, that that locus is not used; it's clicked off, and the only allelic information for the other loci is used for the EKR and EMR calculations. So that is why you're seeing that difference. Something to respond to that? question. Manny, just so that you understand what, up here. As, a, as a new person might might not understand, is the context of all this. As you know, this started with a special bulletin from the FBI on partial match in 2006, and and obviously Dr. Beeper is exactly right about generating criminal leads. So at the time that many of the people were at this table were trying to take partial match information that was popping up on us, we were facing. Uh, a, a strong current of, of argument from a variety of sectors that this is a you are you are sneaking full familial searches in under the banner of partial match and so uh, Gina and others in constructing the partial match protocols were erring on the side of caution to ensure that it could not be said that this was in any way shape or form backdoor familial searching they weren't sitting there with a blank slate saying how's the best way that you know, in the normal four 
which we could generate probative leads. It was, uh, it was an incremental step, and the record should reflect that it was all said by people that, that worked in this committee that it was going to be rare, that it was not going to metastasize into, you know, uh, what some people thought was terrible old familial searching. And that's why you're in this conservative and more conservative um, context. And, you know, DCG has kept their promise. They did exactly what they, they, they told the people that they were going to do. So I just wanted to give you that background, because otherwise it might be a head scratch. Yeah. And there is that disconnect sometimes between science and policy, where what we believe good science would be much more aggressive on it, but policy will sometimes, you know, uh, be more conservative with its approach. And this is this is that amalgam that came together of science and policy. Um, so, in the end, uh, go to the last slide. Although we did see those changes. We looked at those 26. Those 26, as I had indicated. Conclusion slide. Conclusion. Oh, yeah, no. Two that. Two that. What's this? One, one before that. There we go. Um, <coughs> that um, overall, though, CODA 7, we feel is a viable uh, <coughs> partial match module in CODA 7 is a viable uh, uh module to calculate EKR and EMR. Um, as I had indicated, the three that actually led to uh, a, a probative lead in the case to a potential relative, they both met in, in both those cases, or in all three of those cases. Um, it will reduce um, the number of partial matches, but it will reduce the number of non-probative partial matches as well. It's fully supported software, which is important to us because we want a very sound software going forward, at least in the short term. And um, as I indicated, it's using the 2015 expanded SDR population data, which also, as I indicated earlier, includes the expansion loci. And all the local labs and the state lab next in 2017 will have to move to the expanded SDR kits in the beginning of January. And we will be all set in regards to partial matches we would have already have that readiness for that. And um, another big important part in this is that all the local CODIS laboratories have the partial match module and would be able to do the EKR and EMR calculations. And it would certainly reduce the time that it takes to do those calculations and process a partial match. Because right now it's a very paper-driven process up through DCGS to the state lab to do those calculations and then send it back when it would be nice for the local labs to be able to do that right at their, at their local laboratory. Um, so in the end, I guess we're you know, respectively, respectively looking for an approval to replace Dr. G's software with CODA 7. We feel that there is, there is advantages over uh, with CODA 7. And we do feel like it's going to streamline our process as well as we'll gain some efficiencies. And I just wanted to acknowledge go to the, next slide, uh, the folks at the lab that were part of this study, Kerry Sage, who's our state CODIS administrator, who assisted with, um, with the partial match statistical study, as well as Peter Wistor, his supervisor, very computer savvy, and uh, he created the Excel templates and uh, allowed us to uh, really tabulate and calculate those uh, EKR and EMR, or compare the EKR and EMR results quickly. And Jill Dooley is a forensic scientist at our lab. She was the one that tabulated all that data. Uh, it was a fair amount of data that needed to be tabulated, and she did an excellent job with that. And uh, I also wanted to just thank DCGS, the folks at DCGS, for working with me in regards to determining what the outcomes of the partial match basis were. Thank you, Tom. Uh, other questions or comments? Uh, I wonder if it's consistent with your policy and statutes to do housekeeping exercise on the New York State DNA database, with, say the offender database, and look at all the, uh, let's use CODIS 13, the 13 locus matches, sample against sample within the database, looking for duplicates. Uh, Twins, uh, 
we do entry, that entry errors. Yep. 12 locus matches, 11, 10, 9. When uh, Sylvain Lalonde, who is now retired from the RCMP, he was the database administrator of the National DNA Data Bank of Canada, did this in uh, the Great White North, they found about 25 pairs of samples uh, after cleaning up data entry errors and so on as part of their quality assurance housekeeping exercise within their data bank. And they took a look then, a more careful look at those 25 uh, paired samples that matched at either 9, 10, 11, or 12 of the 13 CODIS loci. And they found that 17 of those 25 were full sieves within the data bank. And I think three of the remaining ones are likely sieves but they didn't test or don't test for whys, so they didn't have any way, legitimate way or a thoughtful way to approach that. But uh, has New York State considered doing that, or is that something you have the time to do? And if you did have time, could you do it as part and parcel of a sort of a global um, 2,000 people? Look at your own right. database. Because right. I know you you're. Can I, yeah. I just interrupt just no. a moment to, just to make sure that we're still on the track here. Yeah, yeah. Is, are you suggesting then that this um, this annual cleanup effort <laughs> be related to CODA 7, yes. utilizing CODA 7 to, to yeah. implement some sort of a, a as, as part of an annual maintenance? As part of implementation of, of this new software, which I think I'm keen well, on. The, the soft well, you, the Coda 7 software is already in place. We're currently using the Coda 7 software. The partial match is just a module that's within that that we want to be able to do EKR and EMR calculations. Right. But have you have you thought about doing so this to, to look at the number we, of kin within the New York State? I, you know, based on current center. policy, I'm not sure that searching our offender database for full SIBs, you know, I would certainly have to reach out to legal to determine that. But what we have done is we do look at CO duplicates um, on a weekly basis to determine do we have uh, duplicates. And what happens is there's a duplicate, there, uh, a list is generated, it's sent over to DCGS, <coughs> they verify, you know, are they, is this truly duplicate offenders or are they possibly twins? And we do get that information. We've taken the first step and, and, and what you're talking about from mismatch, we've allowed for one mismatch. Um, but we have not gone on to say, okay, let's allow two mismatch or three mismatch or four mismatch. I think that um, when you start setting up your searches to start identifying, if you're doing that with your offenders, you're starting to identify with siblings. And I think you know that would be more of a legal question whether we can do that. Now, in regards to doing that, it certainly would be a lift to to implement something like that. Um, it's not something that you know, we could do in the short term, but it's something we certainly could think about going forward. So. But as far as the CODA 7 application, that, that application is currently in all the laboratories being used. The partial match module is just a module in order to do the EKR and EMR calculation. I think that, that uh, CODIS database administrators at the state level are so up to their ears and alligators with real searches going on. Right. Uh, crime scene against crime scene, crime scene against offender, et cetera, that sometimes it's useful to step back and just take a look at the data themselves, or partly to understand it, and somewhat research-oriented, but it's also just taking the global, yeah. and the we global understanding yeah. of what you have, of the valuable data that you have. And, and in the fall, the director did, you know, we did have a conversation on, you know, what would and start talking about, you know, can we go to a two mismatch? Um, is there an advantage to go past that? And, you know, it's something we certainly want to continue to look at, but I do believe that we got to be cautious going into that and make sure we understand what types of results we're going to get back from that and make sure that legal understands if there's any ramifications of identifying. I'm not talking certain. about searching crimes. Right, you're yeah. talking offender to offender within yeah. the offender within to offender yeah. database. Yeah, I'll, I'll, just say, I'll just say globally, we're certainly interrogating the data uh, in terms of looking for any kind of mistakes, um, CO duplicates, everything within the exact match and one mismatch. Mm -hmm. 
we are not going below that nor do i believe we have a policy in place to do so so we're certainly doing what you're suggesting within the realm of what we can do important comment thank you um let's bring bring this part to a close any final comment related to the validation of what is said i would just like to end and thank you very much for reviewing that um over this past month appreciate your time i know you're all very busy do i have a motion then to issue a binding recommendation to the new york state commission on forensic science approving the use of codis 7 for the calculation of ekr and emr so motion and second all in favor signify by raising your hand approved thank you very much thank you moving on from new business we have three laboratory disclosures they are for nassau county office of the medical examiner division of forensic services new york city chief medical examiner and the new york state police you can certainly bring any of those laboratory representatives to the table or by phone if you have any questions or comments hearing none we'll move on the next item on the agenda is the executive session and i have a motion that we move into executive session to discuss personnel issues appointments promotions promotions discipline and other items so moved second all in favor say aye aye at this point if you are not a dna subcommittee member i would ask that you please leave the room hey john so that 10 minutes was like that you're only two years old yeah 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 Okay, it's up. We're live. Uh, I'm just making sure because I don't know if it usually comes up and says recording. Yep. I have someone watching it. Oh, he's, he sees it right now? Yep. Okay, okay I guess we are. For some reason, it's uh, still showing the self view on it. Oh, wait a sec. I just paused.
strong favor to simplify by raising your hand. Okay. So that's how it's